Romans chapter 15 and verses 5 to 7 says this. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Have you ever considered that in order to actually bring praise to God that we need to be in unity with one another? This scripture talks about how we're to accept one another the same way that Jesus accepts us. And that's a pretty tall order, I think. And we're to do that in order to actually bring praise to God. I mean, that's a pretty big deal, isn't it? An even bigger deal when you consider that unity, true unity, is a whole lot more than just getting along. Now, a few months ago, while we were still in COVID, uh, in the lockdown, director Zack Snyder released a completely redone version of the Justice League. And my kids and I sat down and we watched it. I think we even talked Tracy into watching it the very next day. Uh, (laughs) So it was this four-hour epic superhero movie, which is totally my jam, right? Superheroes. And, and, And it featured all kinds of heroes from the detective comics, like Wonder Woman, The Flash, and Superman, Cyborg, Aquaman, Batman, of course. All of them coming together to fight aliens who are going to destroy the world. I mean, that sounds about right, doesn't it? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. and so we sat down and we watched it. And honestly, we liked it about as much as we liked any other uh, superhero movie. It was a lot of fun. We watched it. It was really, really long, um, like epically long. It was so long. (laughs) But it was a great movie. We had a lot of fun. But one of the things that really captured me about this film was that you had all of these characters, these these heroes that were endowed with incredible power. They all had these amazing gifts. They all had abilities that, well, let's face it, the rest of us don't have. And, and, And in the beginning, they're useless because they're, I mean, they just can't come together. And while they're not together, they're really doing more uh, of a job of getting in each other's way than they are of actually accomplishing anything else. And it's, it's bad. I mean, they're failing badly, despite all the gifts and talents. And until they find unity, they just can't get it together. This theme has been running through Hollywood since the early days. And you see it time and time again. You see it in in other superhero movies. You you see it in sports movies. You see it in in, in westerns. Uh, You you see it in dramas. You, You see it in all kinds of movies all the time. The same theme over and over again. The theme of unity. It's not just a popular storyline. It's a life theme drawn directly from the Word of God. It's a theme that's meant to be lived by every single one of us, without exception. And that's a pretty big thing, isn't it? Now, in the movies, there's usually some kind of a big tragedy or some kind of a a crisis moment that, you know, drives the team together. And for us... It's in the crisis moment of our salvation when we come to receive Jesus Christ that we begin to see that we cannot keep living our way and we must begin living His way, God's way. And His way is very much about our living in the rhythm and the power of a united body. See, our salvation is meant to draw us together as one. Now, the Apostle Paul, he talks about unity a lot. I mean, over and over again. In fact, if you read through most of his epistles, at some point he touches on it. Uh, In Romans, he talks about it a lot. In Ephesians, he talks about it a lot. And he talks about it in a way that it's not just coming together. It's not just working together, but it's about truly functioning as one living organism. He calls it a body. And more than that, Paul actually gives us some really 
practical information on how we actually achieve, how we actually live this unity that God wants for us. So today I want to talk a little bit about that. And we're going to do that by beginning with what Paul wrote to the Ephesian church. This comes from chapter 4 of Ephesians, and this is verses 1 to 6. And this is what he said. He said, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And one of the things I've always loved about the Apostle Paul is he, he doesn't sugarcoat anything, right? He just kind of lays it right on the line. He quickly pulls us into focus, points out the bottom line. This is what you need to understand. And it's convicting, truthfully. It's very convicting sometimes, and we're troubled by it on occasion when we read through what he's saying, but it is powerfully effective in getting the point across. Live a life that is worthy of the calling you've received. Now, I often talk about our being called to be ambassadors of the kingdom of God. Live in this world from another kingdom. We are ambassadors of the kingdom of God. And when I talk about that, I'll often add, are you living a life worthy of that? Because that's really the question we should be asking ourselves. Are we living a life worthy of that? And as challenging as that question can be, the truth is you cannot live a life worthy of the call that God has placed on your life if you're still trying to do things your way instead of his. That's what I've learned in this journey. And it is a powerful truth that has helped me so much. You see, unity is a part of the foundation of the call that's placed on our lives. We can't live in unity here, and we can't live in unity out there if we're still living our lives for ourselves and not Him. I mean, this is literally what spiritual formation or discipleship is all about. We can't live a life worthy of our call unless we're living our life His way. So what do we do? I mean, what does a life lived in unity actually look like? What is He calling us to? It's a very good question. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so the Apostle Paul actually points this stuff out. This is why we're looking at Ephesians 4 today, because Apostle Paul is actually talking about this, unpacking a little bit for us. And he talks about three big things here, so we're going to have a look at those. The first of those big things is actually how we deal with ourselves with regard to unity. This is, this is about how we deal with ourselves. Paul says this. He says, be completely humble and gentle. Now, I'm going to give you the de dictionary definition of humility. And it is having a modest or low estimate of one's own importance. And I'm giving you the dictionary definition here because I want us all to understand that this is not a presentation. This is it's not a mask that we wear. It's not a thing we put on like clothes on the outside. Humility is not acting like people are more important or more valuable than you. It is knowing that people are more valuable than ourselves. It's not a view to have. It's a position we take. Now, before there's a bunch of misunderstanding and hurt feelings, I want to tell you what C.S. Lewis wrote about humility because, honestly, I think it's the very best quote I have ever heard about humility. And this is what he said. C.S. Lewis wrote, Humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Isn't that great? Humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. So in that, genuine humility elevates the people around you. They see it, they feel it, they know it, and let's face it, everyone wants to feel valued. Everyone wants to feel important. Everyone wants to matter. Genuine humility does that for the people in your life. So be 
completely humble and gentle. While we're talking about that, I want you to understand what gentleness means. Gentleness in the dictionary is being mild in temperament or behavior. Now, this, this actually speaks to what pours out of our hearts when we're humble, doesn't it? If humility is the position that we take, then gentleness is what pours out of that position. It's what pours out of our heart. When you are completely humble and gentle, you affect people at their core. Humility and gentleness dissolves threat. It takes away the walls that people build up in their lives. It softens hearts. It, it encourages openness. I mean, it seems kind of counterintuitive, like it's backwards, but humility and gentleness are powerful tools. Powerful, powerful tools. At perhaps the most difficult time of my entire life, I met a guy named Andy Weatherston, and I'm not sure if I've talked about him before. I will often talk about this man because of the impact that he had on my life. At a point in my life when I was angry with, you know, everybody, uh, at a point when I was just at the core of my being, I was frightened, I was vulnerable, I was suspicious and completely closed off. When every adult in my life had an agenda for me, Andy had something else in mind. He very simply just, he just loved me. He didn't try to get me to do anything. He didn't try to convince me of anything. He didn't try to show me that I was wrong about what. He just loved on me and he showed me that I mattered, that he cared about who I was. And I don't mind telling you that was no small task. Andy believed truly that I was valuable, that I was important. Even with my long hair and the scowl on my face, his attitude toward me was, was one of encouragement and one of love. He treated me with respect. He was the only person, seemingly, that would treat me with respect and dignity because he always treated people with respect and dignity. His humility and his gentleness softened my heart. The, you know, my suspicions quickly dissolved. My, my hardness kind of quickly softened. And my heart opened, even if just a little bit, so that Andy could pour into it. And to this day, I remember him fondly because he just loved me. He was completely humble and completely gentle with me. He made that a part of who he was. It was very much the person that he still is today. And it affected me powerfully. He changed my life. And I can honestly say that if it wasn't for Andy, I probably would not be standing here today. He changed my life. And all it took was humility and gentleness. Just imagine what could be accomplished if we all lived like that. And while you're thinking about that, consider this. That is what God has called us to. That's big, isn't it? While we're talking about it, I want you to know this is a really great tool to take for a test drive. Because <laughs> it, it doesn't disappoint, ever. It really doesn't. And if, if you might be one of those people that's thinking, well, this really just isn't my personality. It's not really who I am. Then I want to encourage you to let your perspective shift. Renew your mind. Be transformed. Let the Lord do the work in you that he's trying to do. Because this is what we are called to in Christ. Don't continue to live as the world does, believing that you are all that matters. Change what you have known and recognize the immense value in the people around you. And in humility, be gentle in your relationships with them and watch, watch what happens. It's incredible. If you want to live a life worthy of the calling that you've received, then you must be completely humble and gentle. Now, the second thing that Paul talks about here is actually how we deal with other people, right? We talk a little bit about how we deal with ourselves, get ourselves in line. Now, how do we deal with others? And what he says is this. He says, be patient, bearing with one another in love. And so here is, is where things, you know, perhaps might get a little bit more difficult. And that's because patience is not exactly something that we do very well in our culture, is it? 
I mean, we've, we've moved further and further into the realm of instant gratification, so much so that it makes it so much more difficult for most of us to tolerate anything, <laughs> really. Never mind what the last year and a half has done to all of our patients, yeah? Now, patience, according to the dictionary, is being able to accept or tolerate delays, problems, or suffering without becoming annoyed or anxious. <laughs> oh, oh, that's rough. Now, again, I'm giving you the dictionary definition here because I think, you know, a lot of us, I think we use the word patience when what we're actually talking about in that moment is endurance. You see, because when we endure something, we're, we're really just putting up with it, right? You get that? Like when we endure a thing that's going on, we're, we're putting up with it. We're getting through it right? I mean, we may not even be reacting. There may not be anything pouring out, but really we're just getting through. We're not accepting it. We're still experiencing the negative emotions, including being annoyed and being anxious. We're just not acting on them. That's endurance. That's not patience. Putting up with something is not the same thing as having or offering patience. So you understand, when we're exercising patience, we're not just putting up with something, we're talking about actually having stillness and internal peace while we're experiencing delays, problems, suffering. Patience is actually about you being okay with not having it your way. <laughs> okay, let me say that again. Patience is about being okay with not having it your way. Now, Tracy and I have had the wonderful privilege as parents of operating in the realm of zone defense uh, for a long time now, meaning that there are more of them than there are of us. And I'll tell you the truth, we have had our fair share of those days. Hey, parents, you know, you know what I mean by those days? It's the days when all three kids or four kids or whatever it may be are all doing their own thing in their own crazy way and they're all going in different directions. Yeah, zone defense becomes an interesting art at that point. And in those situations, I talk about exercising patience, but really what I'm talking about is just getting through it. Because the truth is, when my kids, if my kids are disobeying, I don't always like it. When they're running around screaming out loud in their yahoo voices, yeah, I don't always feel peaceful inside. That's just the truth of it. Sometimes I feel like pulling my hair out. I mean, it just isn't, it isn't there. I'm not quite there. But Paul tells us that when we deal with others, we're supposed to be patient. Not just pretend. We're supposed to be patient. And I go, oh. And that means, see, what he's saying is that I'm supposed to be able to tolerate all that madness and mayhem without becoming annoyed or anxious. <laughs> and if you just had like an eek moment... Yeah, don't worry, because I have them too when I think about this. And I've come to terms with the fact that there still are places in my life that I, I still have yet some growth to do. And, and maybe that's you too. I don't know. It's often why I, I, I always say to people, you know, I don't pray for patience because when I do, God puts me in these situations where I have to exercise patience and I just don't want it. I'm up to here. Right? I don't want any more. But that's the truth of it. That's how we grow or at least one of the ways we grow in our patience. Now, I don't know who needs to hear this today, but the key to patience, please hear this, the key to patience is surrender. It's letting go. It's giving it over to God. It's letting Him worry about it. It's letting Him have His way and not worrying about what you want then this may mean that you have to take action in a moment of great pressure. Because surrender is a choice. It should never be a reaction. It's not something we can do in reaction. It's not something we do by accident. It's got to be done on purpose. We need to, to exercise this. We need to try this from time to time so that we get better at it. So whenever you're faced with a situation that's causing impatience, you're feeling that impatience, we can do three things. One, pause. Just, just stop. 
Stop in your own space, in your own moment. Two, take a moment to regroup. And I don't know, maybe let's take some deep breaths. Sometimes I have to, I have to count to, to ten. I remember when we were little kids, they would drive me nuts, and I used to do that. I used to stop and go one, two, three. And I, and I did this once. They were just wired. The kids were little, little, little. And they was like, I was ready to just pop at that point. And so I put my head down, and I went one, two, three, four. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I lifted up my head and the room is empty and Tracy's sitting on the couch over there grinning at me. She says, they're hiding. (laughs) So I don't know, maybe you need to take that moment to pause and and count whatever it is. You just need to regroup for a moment, get, get, get the blood pressure down just a little bit and then take a positive action to resolve the issue that's really in here. Impatience is a reaction that we have in the flesh that results from not getting our own way. Did you know that? That's what impatience is. Impatience is a reaction that we have in our flesh when we don't get our own way. Now, having said that, (laughs) it has nothing to do, really, with what other people are doing because the issue is in our own heart. So when you flip that over, patience also has nothing to do with what the other person is doing. It has everything to do with what's going inside of us because patience is an attitude of the heart. So what it all comes down to is that the real issue with disunity is inside us and we have to stop thinking it's everybody else. Right? I can have unity with people who are not quite there yet. I can have patience with people who are not quite there yet. I can love people who are not quite there yet. I can do those things because he gives me strength to do it. Paul says we are to bear with one another in love. You know, without patience, we can't have love. It's true. Without patience, we can't have love. Everybody know 1 Corinthians 13, the love passage? You've been to a wedding before? They always recite it, right? Love is? Yeah, it's not a mistake that that's the first attribute or character that is mentioned in that list of what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind, right? Love is patient. Living a life worthy of our call requires that we deal with others in love. And love requires that we have patience. And in order to be patient, we cannot hang on to our own agenda or our own anything for that matter. Because being patient requires us to surrender, to give it over to God. That we would have His stillness, that we would have His internal peace in us. Because trust me, when I try and do that on my own, I fail miserably. I need that from him. It has to be his. Because I, you know, when it comes to me just trying to be patient with my kids and they're going, you know, being kids, I get impatient like that. But he gives me strength and it changes everything. Now, truthfully, this may take some practice. It has for me and I still got a ways to go. But if you want to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Now, the third thing that Paul talks about here is how we deal with the us, everybody. This is about how we relate with the entire group of believers with regard to unity. And Paul tells us that we are to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now here's where we get to the brass tacks of it all. This is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, right? I want you to notice two things right here. First, notice the words, make every effort. Make every effort. The truth is, is it's going to take effort to have unity, There's there's going to be work involved, and not just in the beginning. There will always be work involved to be unified, to be a body, to work together as one, to be that organism that Paul talks about, the body of Christ. It It takes effort. And even then, it may not go according to our plan, that's for sure. But we're going to have to work at the relationships around us in order to have fruit there. 
Many years ago when I was working as a mechanic, or an apprentice anyway, as a mechanic, my boss used to say to me all the time, he used to say, anything worth doing is worth doing well. And he used to say it all the time for all kinds of different reasons, but he was right. I mean, in that context, he was saying, Aaron, work harder. But the, but the truth is, is that applies not just to the work that we do with our hands, but it applies to our relationships as well. Anything worth doing is worth doing well. Now, there isn't another human being on this planet that I love more than my wife, Tracy. Sorry, kids. Without her, there is no you. <laughs> But this is the truth of it, and, and, and as far as I'm concerned, she's so amazing, it's hard for me to believe sometimes. I can spend every moment of every day with Tracy, and not only do I not get tired of her, I, I, I want to be in that place. I love it. I, I crave being with her. And when we're separated, I, like half the time, that's all I can think about. I just want to be with Tracy, doing stuff with Tracy. But I also promise you that our relationship has always required work. Always. <laughs> Especially living with me, right? That's, that's, okay. <laughs> you see, even with two people that are so clearly meant to be together, we have to put effort in how we are with one another so things will, uh, or things will eventually go sideways on us. We have to spend energy and work at making sure things are going well between us in order to ensure that they do go well between us. And that's important. But I also want to tell you something about our relationship that you've got to know about how relationships work. And this is critical because if, if you don't know this or you don't get this, you can train wreck all the relationships in your life. And this is it. Are you ready for this? When I talk about our relationship, the work that I have to do in that relationship is in me. It's not in her. The work that Tracy has to do in our relationship between the two of us is in Tracy. It's not in me. The work that you have to do, the effort that you have to put into your relationships is work that's done in yourself. And this is true of all relationships. You are not to try and sort out someone else's issues. One, because you can't. <laughs> and two, unless you're invited in, that's just a train wreck waiting to happen. You are not to sort out other people's issues unless they invite you in to help them. Apart from that, the only work that you have is in yourself. And when Paul says that you are to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit, the effort that you're going to be making is going to be inside of you. And I say this because we need to stop worrying about what other people are doing and focus a little bit more on, do I have something that I need to it's easy, it is easy to sit and go, well, they're messed up. It's not working because, because the other person. It's easy to do that. We can all do that. Man, we start doing that when we're two years old. It's my brother's fault, right? I love my brother, by the way. <laughs> it's easy to point a figure and say it's their fault. It takes real humility. Oh, did we just go back there? It takes real humility to be able to go, okay, this something's off, what in me needs to change? Make every effort to keep unity of the Spirit. And we do that, as Paul puts it, through the bond of peace. Now this is important. I want to talk about the word bond for a minute because it's a very important word. Not only is it a very cool last name, but bond means that it fastens together bond to bond something i mean I'm, I'm talking like chains like really pulls it together it also makes things stay together the way that glue does it, it it's a commitment that has a very strong force that holds things together so peace is a glue that holds us together peace doesn't just bring us together it keeps us there 1 Corinthians 14 and 33 reminds us, For God is not a God of disorder, but a God of peace, as in all the congregations of the saints. His word assumes that this is how we'll live. 2 Corinthians 13 11 says, Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. 
I mean, do you want God with you and the things that you're doing? I know I do. I think about that, and I'm like, yeah, man, that's exciting. Well, uh, I need to live in peace. When we make the effort to live the way that he has called us to live, I mean, he will be with you in the effort that you're making. Do you want God in your efforts? Sure we do. Do you want his power alive in the relationships that you're working on? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Do you want his presence affecting the outcome of all of those smooth going and difficult relationships in your life? Of course. Live in peace. Do it on purpose. Be intentional about it. But in order to do all of this, you have to let some things go. I'm sure of it. I I sure did. I still do. I mean, He's showing me things all the time that are getting in the way. We, we, we don't intend to, but we often build obstacles between what we have and what we want and what God actually wants for us. So it means that you're going to have to surrender your will to Him. It means that you'll have to hold others above yourself, as Paul wrote for us. It means that you will have to be humble and gentle, and it may not always be easy, but you will have to make the choice to be at peace with the people in your life. If you're going to live a life worthy of the calling you've received, you need to deal with yourself and others and and the us by being completely humble and gentle, by being patient, bearing with one another in love, and making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And remember always, unity begins with you.